So welcome everybody. Um, this is Jeremy Grimshaw, I'm one of the co-leads of the Evidence Commission Secretariat, and we're delighted to welcome you to um, uh, this uh, update of uh, progress on the Evidence Commission over the last 12 months. Um, this is the second of the uh, webinars we've had today. We had one in uh, uh, um, early morning for uh, uh, North Americans and Europeans, and this one is more um, timed for West Coast uh, North Americans uh, and also people in Australia and Asia. So we're delighted to welcome you today. Uh, just so you know, we're recording today's webinar and we'll share the recording presentation with you after this. And if at any point in time uh, you have questions, please add your question to the chat box and then we'll direct the questions throughout today's webinars. Depending on uh, how things are going, we might do that actually during the webinar uh, or during the, uh, 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 as we go forward, or we might wait until the question period at the end. Um, I want to just sort of give you a little bit of, inf of, of highlight of what's happened the last 12 months, and John Lavis will um, uh, uh, put a lot more meat on, on this bone. But basically, um, after the publication of the Evans Commission Report uh, in January last year, we uh, identified three major priorities um, focusing on formalizing and strengthening domestic evidence support systems, enhancing and leveraging the global evidence architecture, and putting evidence at the center for everyday lives. So that has been our major priorities at the Secretariat. Next slide, Jim. And to do that, we have uh, we've, we've, we've created a number of you know, working groups. Um, we have uh, 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 we, we are, we are doing what we're calling RESSES, and John will talk more about that, but basically baseline assessments about uh, where countries' evidence support systems are in six countries around, uh, 12 countries around the world. And we have um, a, a, a lead group who are learning from each other as we move forward. We've created a global evidence producers group uh, to talk about how we build the global evidence architecture and also a citizen leadership group um, uh, uh, to talk about how we can think about and uh, supporting better evidence use um, uh, uh, in day-to-day -day life. And then around all that, we've created the Evidence Commission Implementation Council. This is a new group, uh, which we hope will be very inclusive. So if you're interested in this, let us know. But the idea is that um, basically this will be a forum where we can share progress to date and share good ideas and learn from what other people are doing in the field to try to promote um, evidence-based care. So um, I'm delighted today to really welcome you to uh, what, what will be, I think, a very exciting um, panel. We have four of the original commissioners with us. Um, so uh, um, Andrew Lee, who's a, a, a government policymaker from Australia, uh, Jing Li He, who is an NGO organizational leader in China, uh, Julian Elliott, who's a commissioner and research leader from Australia, and is also uh, in Australia leading up the, the RESA, um, uh, Maureen Smith, who is a commissioner and citizen leader from Canada and is a co-chair of our citizen leaders group. And they're joined by uh, Lara de Santos Buera, who's an NGO leader in Brazil, um, but also is le again leading the RESA in Brazil as she moves forward. And Zach Mann, who's an implementation council member and a research leader from Australia. And then finally, um, we have uh, um, John Lavis, who's my co-lead of the Secretariat, who's going to give you a, a quick update in terms of what progress we've made. And then also Jen Thornell Verma, who's the Secretary of Executive Lead, and she'll handle the, um, uh, the, 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 the discussions. So I'm gonna pass over to John now, over to you. Great, thanks very much, uh, Jeremy. Um... Just uh, reassure me that you can hear me and see the full screen slides. Yep. Great. So thanks very much, everybody, for joining us. This is our last um, opportunity to engage you in, in, in giving us feedback about our high-level messaging related to update 2023. So I'd encourage you to be thinking as we go through, are there better ways to say what we're saying in order to reach the people who we're trying to influence? So we're one year out from the release of the report. It was released in January of 2022. We have some good news, and we also have some reasons why we think we need to double down on our efforts. The good news, uh, governments in some countries, notably in some Latin American countries, for example, open to new approaches to decision-making and evidence use. A reason to double down, many policymakers, organizational leaders, and professionals have largely returned to pre-pandemic approaches. On the plus side, some funders and donors 
Some impact-oriented evidence producers are piloting evidence coordination mechanisms, but uh, a reason again to double down on our efforts. Many producers continue to operate without significant coordination and to generate significant research waste. And finally, while during this COVID era, many citizens have become more aware of the potential value of evidence, many others have become more distrustful of decision makers and evidence. Uh, Jeremy's alluded to our three Evidence Commission priorities. Uh, these were agreed in partnership with the two other groups that convened meetings in the last 18 months to deal with this issue. Um, we're working with, as Jeremy noted, four different groups to support action, and these three implementation priorities cover 20 of the Evidence Commission's 24 recommendations. Part of what Update 2023 will do is remind people about some of the important concepts and ideas that are needed in order to pursue these implementation priorities. One of them is we need to respond with the right mix of forms of evidence when we're asked questions. And that means both matching the form of domestic evidence to the right step in the decision making process, and that's what you see here in this infographic, but it also means combining domestic evidence, so what have we learned in our country or our province and state, with the best global evidence. What have we learned from around the world, including how it varies by groups and contexts. And that matching of the right form of evidence uh, is absolutely key uh, because the alternative is to zero in only on certain forms of evidence that may be getting a lot of attention now. Some of you will recognize the infographic on the right, which originally had three forms of evidence that were getting a lot of weight and attention. But with the COVID era, a bit behind us, modeling seems to have receded a bit more into the background with other forms of evidence. Evaluation is still there, getting a fair bit of attention, uh, and data analytics perhaps even more. We also want to remind people in Update 2023 about how important it is to use best evidence versus some of the other things that get a lot of attention now. And we give four examples on this slide. Those single studies that haven't yet been appraised and put alongside other studies addressing the same question squeaky wheel experts who don't speak in a way that makes it possible to judge their accuracy, old school expert panels, and I'll come back to this one in a moment, and citizen and stakeholder engagement processes that don't provide ways in for evidence. And if we dig into that third example a bit, those old school, good old boys sitting around the table approaches will really never make it to the podium. To get a gold medal in this space of expert panels, you need to convene people with the right mix of issue specific knowledge, evidence appraisal expertise and lived experience, you need to follow rigorous processes, and you need to adjust your recommendations as the context, the issues, and the evidence evolve, as is now being done with living expert panels. And one thing we hear from a lot of people is, if Australia can go for the gold with its national health guidelines, why can't we do it in our country and for other sectors outside health? So that brings us to our implementation priority number one formalize and strengthen domestic evidence support systems. We're currently working with teams in 12 countries, uh, Laura is one of them, uh, to conduct these rapid evidence support system assessments and we're working with this country team leads group. And what we want to do in each country, for Laura it's Brazil, identify what's going well that needs to be systematized and scaled up and what ga gaps should be prioritized to fill, and then work with government policymakers, organizational leaders, professionals, and citizens to push for improvements. When we conduct a rapid evidence support system assessment, we need to start with a solid understanding of what a domestic evidence support system is. It has features on the demand side, uh, structures and processes to incorporate evidence into routine advisory and decision-making processes, mechanisms to build and sustain an evidence culture, uh, mechanisms to strengthen capacity for evidence use. And then between those people asking for evidence and those responding to those questions, we need mechanisms to elicit and prioritize evidence needs and package evidence from multiple sources into inputs that align with advisory and decision-making processes. And then on the supply side, we need evidence support units that are timely and demand-driven and focused on contextualizing what we already know, that stock of existing evidence, 
both domestic and global, for a given decision in an equity sensitive way. And we need to recognize that a domestic evidence support system is different from a research system. A research system tends to focus on creating generalizable knowledge and to measure success with peer reviewed grants and publications. And it's also different from an, a, an innovation system where the focus is more commercializing products and processes and where success is more often measured with revenues. So conducting a RESA or a rapid evidence support system assessment means asking questions about each of the potential features of an evidence support system, creating a bit of a baseline and then taking action based on what's learned. It means looking at websites, documents, conducting interviews, and it, we ask particular questions on the decision maker side, the evidence demand side. What types of decisions do you make? And what does that mean for the types of evidence you need? Do you have the enablers in place? Is the culture there? Has the capacity been developed? Are your questions typically complex and do they require the engagement of multiple evidence support units? And then on the supply side, we ask questions like, do you have people who can be those general contractors, bring in the right trades or the right form of evidence, depending on the question? And can you provide integrated responses that bring together the evidence across all those applicable forms of evidence, but also learn from experiences in other countries with jurisdictional scans, learn from foresight work, uh, leverage rich experience with key informant interviews and engage citizens and stakeholders in collective problem solving. And are all the relevant forms of evidence covered by the existing evidence support units that you can turn to? So this slide looks at the features of an evidence support system. And it looks separately at those groups that are in what we call central agencies. So places like cabinet offices, treasury board that kind of have a whole of government perspective. It also looks at line departments, health, education, environment. And it looks at parliaments and legislatures to ask what mechanisms they have in place. And then it looks at how questions from those different groups get streamed out to groups that can help answer those questions. Um, and it looks at whether and how those multiple forms of evidence can be brought back in and in integrated me mechanisms. We also look to see, are there networks that allow you to go to the network and then have the work go out to evidence support units that may focus on specific forms of evidence or alternatively units that are focused on sectors or other substantive domains, climate action, education, health. And we look to those units to be well connected to the global evidence architecture so that they can draw on global public goods like living evidence syntheses in their work. Some of the types of things we're hearing from these assessments most countries have relatively few of these features and even fewer of those features are working optimally, especially when crises emerge. We're also hearing things like, we have several leading edge groups in government, but generally we suffer a hollowing out of our, of our policy capacity and a failure to keep up with new developments and evidence use. We've also heard we mostly rely on in-house staff and a few management consulting firms, but we have no mechanisms to get the right questions to best in class and service oriented evidence support units and to incorporate their insights into policies and programs. We often hear as well, we do fairly well with data analytics, somewhat well with evaluation, although we still don't use it to drive ongoing learning and improvement, and we do relatively poorly with other forms of evidence. So now if we transition to our second implementation priority, enhance and leverage the global evidence architecture, this is a, an enabler of that first priority. If we have a better global evidence architecture, we can provide de better domestic evidence support, but it also helps to drive the efforts of multilateral organizations like the UN system to support their member states. We're seeing some leadership from the UN system, notably WHO with its normative guidance, but also pockets of innovation and leadership at UNICEF and UNDP. 
We're seeing some pilots, but no broad efforts to coordinate the production of evidence related global public goods. So those problems with the low uh, signal to noise ratio that we documented in our original report remain present today. And we see anecdotal examples of many funders and many evidence producers, unfortunately, going their own way. So we're having many conversations with funders and donors, with many global public good producers, and we're also analyzing what's been learned in the past by how, when people have tried to improve the global evidence architecture. One model that we've been talking about for improving coordination starts by better connecting the global and as I'll come to in a minute, the domestic. At the global level, what's key is that we have teams that respond to emerging global priorities with a focus on increased coordination, reducing duplication, and producing things like living evidence syntheses that then every country can draw on. And groups specifically that commit to working with existing networks and platforms to maximize efficiencies and synergies and to strengthen and implement standards. And we see some exciting uh, opportunities here. The Living Evidence Alliance, which uh, Julian can speak to, a really promising prototype. But for every Living Alliance, we see so many examples, unfortunately, of low quality products dealing with relatively unimportant questions. And we still see so many societal questions remaining unanswered. We also see global public good producers like Cochrane in perhaps their most fragile ever funding position. And if we turn now to domestic evidence support uh, networks, these are the groups that respond to emerging domestic priorities, ideally in ways that leverage and uh, enable the implementation of global public goods through their more contextualized evidence synthesis and support. And they too can be drawn together into networks. Uh, we have a particular example of being tasked with providing a rapid contextualized evidence synthesis in only three days. In the past, we would have done the best we could, but because a global public good was available that had already identified and appraised more than 17,000 studies, we could pull down the, the studies that were relevant to our context in Canada and produce a very high uh, quality contextualized evidence response in only three days. The other piece of this puzzle are funders and donors. They are very powerful lever of change. And I sometimes feel like we could meet a remarkable number of our domestic evidence needs if we just saved money from research waste. We need global funders, national funders, donors, committing to fund an evolving suite of living evidence syntheses on the big questions of the day. They, should, they could start by sharing information, they should move to coordination, ideally they would pool funds, they would have very high standards for processes, products and partnerships, they would measure and manage teams performance, but there would also be ways with funding from national entities to fund those uh, complementary domestic evidence support units that use those global public goods. And here global funders and donors can help those units based in low middle income countries. And you'll see the quote at the bottom, lots of promising pilot projects, but we hear from many funders, they know they really have to start doing better. And then this brings me to our final implementation priority, putting evidence at the center of everyday life. Uh, we see small scale responses in this space, a lot of attention on polarization, misinformation, maximizing the benefits of artificial intelligence with things like chat GPT while minimizing its harms. And here our goal is to ask the question, how can we do much better uh, in putting evidence at the center of everyday life? Many of you know the context here, citizens make many decisions where evidence could be helpful. We give you three examples on the left, but there are a lot of challenges in doing so. So much information, a lot of misinformation, citizens typically left on their own to find, understand, and use evidence, and governments, businesses, and NGOs not setting things up in ways that make it easy for citizens to use evidence. These are still relatively early days in understanding what works in putting evidence at the center of everyday life, but we have a sense of where the action ha has to happen. 
helping citizens judge what others are claiming or more generally finding and receiving reliable information, making evidence available to citizens when they're making choices, engaging citizens in asking questions and answering them, um, and making evidence-based choices the easy option. And there's also promising examples, and we give a number on this page, that's acclaim.org, give well, the work of the James Lind Alliance, nudge strategies. So we have a sense of what this future direction looks like, uh, but we really need to start to evaluate them rigorously and make them available at scale. So this brings me to my final slide. We really need to capitalize on windows of opportunity and not just return to old ways of doing things. COVID-19 showed us the perils of many of those old ways of doing things, but it also spurred many innovations that need to become the new normal. And if we don't act now, we're not going to be prepared to address future crises. And my final comment is the door is open. If you are keen to contribute to any of these three implementation priorities, we have tangible examples here of how you can help. But if you can also complement what we're doing, we would be delighted to see people take up the work that we haven't yet got to. So that's a quick run through. We'd warmly welcome uh, feedback on this messaging. And I'm very, very keen to hear what uh, my colleagues have to say about next steps. So Jen, back to you. Thanks so much, John. We do have one question in the chat. I'll throw to you and then I'm going to come to Andrew Jinglin and Laura to get us started uh, talking about domestic evidence support systems. But Beth White asks, are there any examples or a particularly good example where integrating different types of evidence for decision making has been done quite well? So is there is there you gave lots of examples throughout mm -hmm. the presentation, but she's looking for one on that front. Well, I, you know, I, I know the stuff that I know from our own experience. I think we, during COVID, became somewhat good with what we call these rapid evidence profiles. We were often only given a few days for whatever the question of the day was, and we became fairly good at uh, doing a combination of what we called an evidence scan that identified the available syntheses, but also identified single studies from our own jurisdiction and conducting a jurisdictional scan where we would say, what is every Canadian province and territory doing? And for whatever the issue is, for countries that were a bit ahead of us, what were they finding and what were they doing? So if Israel, Australia, other countries were a bit ahead, we would zero in on them on the jurisdictional scan. So that was an effort to pull together um, evidence syntheses, typically single studies or evaluations along with the jurisdictional scan. But I think we have a long way to go to get to a world where single products bring you the best data analytics, the best modeling, the best evaluation, the best evidence synthesis alongside these other experiences. So I think we can point to a few examples, but this to me is a hugely important growth area that we need to be working on. Thanks so much, John. Andrew, I'm gonna to come to you first. Uh, Jeremy gave you a brief introduction, but you're a member of parliament in the Australian government. You're the assistant minister for competition, charities and treasury. We're grateful you could be here and you were on the journey with us when the commission report landed a year ago. Now, as we're thinking about domestic evidence support system, I'd love to hear what progress are, are you seeing uh, in Australia in this area? Well, thanks very much, Jen. Uh, great to be part of the webinar. Uh, as we do in Australia, I'd acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the lands of the Ngunnawal people and acknowledge their elders past and present. Uh, it was a real uh, wake-up call for me to be part of the Global Commission on Evidence and to see that many of the challenges we're facing in Australia uh, are replicated in other countries around the world. Uh, and yet there's a lot we can learn from one another and uh, looking at the What Works centres in the UK, uh, looking at the way in which living evidence syntheses have been rolled out in medicine uh, does inspire me to think that social policy can follow the path that uh, public health and uh, uh, medicines have followed in previous decades. We're looking at setting up an evidence unit uh, uh, centralised within government in order to, to do two things, Jen. Uh, one will be to run a series of evaluations because we need to do a better job of evaluating programs, building a feedback loop that shows what works and what doesn't. Uh, that's not uh, ideological, it's pragmatic. Uh, when you've got good evidence, then you're able to uh, move funding to programs that have greater impact. Uh, and you're able to work out for whom programs work best. 
Uh, as one uh, randomist said to me, he's never met a program that works equally for all its participants. So high quality evaluation can be a useful way of, of fine tuning programs. The other main aim of our evidence unit uh, will be to build the capacity of evidence right across government. Because unlike auditing, uh, you know, good evaluation needs to be built in from the start of a program. So we're hoping that we'll work with public servants and different agencies so they can build in evaluation from the get go. Thanks so much, Andrew. Um, Laura, I'll come to you and Jinglin. I'm going to come to you next if you want to turn on your, your camera. But uh, Laura, you're also one of the um, rapid evidence support system assessment leads in addition to your role. Uh, leadership role with Instituto Veridas. And so similarly, what progress are you seeing in Brazil and Latin America that you can share on the domestic front? Thank you so much, Jen. Uh, such a pleasure to be here. So for us, the COVID pandemic was a huge wake up call because we saw many evidence units uh, that were not coordinated. Some evidence units that were born during the pandemic focusing on key complex problems. And we rapidly understood that we needed to map these units and work together in coordination. So in April, 2021, we created the Brazilian Coalition for Evidence um, that is trying to to coordinate the work, understand shared problems, try to make sense of the methods. And most of all, uh, we understand there are a lot of networks and very important ones such as Evipnet Brazil, but some of them are in niches, uh, either health or public safety, but the COVID problems, they were very transversal and transsectoral in Brazil. So the questions were very much shared. And then for us, it was quite important and uh, cause of optimism to be working together maybe for the first time in many many years to recognize what each evidence center was good doing, what types of evidence they felt more comfortable. We understood with our government stakeholders that loads of questions regarding qualitative evidence uh, and implementation were the main uh, focus for them during the pandemic. So having a nice engine to get these questions answered and avoid duplication of efforts was quite important. And then inspired by that, and with some exchanges with our colleagues from the region of Latin America and the Caribbean, we also created the Latin America and the Caribbean Evidence Hub to try to be a network of networks and coordinate uh, the same question. So as John was mentioning, we could focus on then contextualizing the evidence available to our country's specificities. Like in Brazil is such a huge country. It's almost like we have five countries within one, uh, but we have shared problems with our colleagues in Colombia, Trinidad and Tobago and Chile. So making the most of our uh, knowledge power and and our uh, stakeholder engagement was key during these COVID times. And we are happy to see that this interest keeps going right now. And we're having different governments now newly elected with some progressive agendas related to science. So we're very uh, interested in seeing the next steps and hope to work closely both with the executive and the legislative and judiciary branches in our countries. Fantastic, thank you so much, Laura. Jinglin, can I just check in that you're uh, you're there? You can hear us. Great. Similarly, I, I know you've been doing so much work to bring the Evidence Commission report and its recommendations to China. Can you share some of the developments there in terms of what is uh, working to formalize and, and and sort of support evidence support? Okay, thank you, Jane, and thank you for everybody. Good morning, early morning in Beijing. No, in China, now I'm in Hainan, Ireland, not in Beijing. Yeah, it's a nice place, yes, for holidays, because it's a spring, it's spring, you know, it's a Chinese New Year holidays. So nice to meet you, yeah. Uh, yes, I would like to summarize some progress or activities in the past years. So mainly we focus on advocacy and also share the information of the uh, contents and of our commission report. 
it, it's very good we have Chinese version. Thank you for the teams work together for translation and uh, formulating the reports. It's very useful and uh, so we got uh, so positive feedback from our participants during the launch event and the workshop about recommendation report on, uh, and also the we strengthen the partnership with the you know the uh, different sectors such as universities, research institute, NGOs, and also the UN agencies. So this is very important for our next step for the you know for uh, country you know the evidence based you know the countries evidence support system in China. And also, we also have a good discussion with our partners or colleagues on how to redo it. So we already discussed about action plan about you know how to be strengthening the training workshop for young professionals, for journalists, as well as for you know the science communicators. So that is very important start point for for next step, and also. And during the discussion, we also think there is a, there are some good opportunities for the expansion the activities. First of all, the, in China we have a very good technical or expert team on the they have very good expertise, you know, on act, uh, evidence base. And also we have potential partners such as NGOs and UN agencies on different topics such as for people with disabilities, for aging population, on gender equity, for those kind of topics. We also can learn some other country experience through support by the commission secretary and the commission, other commissioners. So, and we also think there are some good platforms or opportunities for us, such as in China, we have 2030 health aging initiatives. So we can use this, uh, you know, health, sorry, health China initiatives. We can use this platform to strengthen the evidence support system. And as well as globally, we in China, we also think about it's a good platform on um, SDGs, you know, the for SDG goals. So those kind of, you know, the good opportunity for us in the future, because of the COVID pandemic in the past three years, people also think it's very important. We have to collect rigorous, you know, evidence and for policy makings. So that is very important, you know, the opportunity for us. We are looking forward to, to learn and, uh, you know, to try to do something in China. Okay, thank you, Jane. Thank you so much, Yingman, and Happy New Year. Thanks for joining us on your vacation. Andrew, I want to come back to you because there's a question from Michelle Habe in the chat who says that in Australia and many other countries, uh, you know, there's it's quite adept at using evidence to inform clinical practice guidelines, medical, pharmaceutical interventions, but what's being done to improve public health policy decision making and they reference taxes, subsidies, regulation, clear criteria for decision making and a transparent process. Can you shed some light on that? Well, Michelle's certainly right that we need to raise the evidence bar right across the board. I look to organizations like the Education and Endowment Foundation in the United Kingdom, which is running a whole suite of randomized trials, looking at educational in interventions, uh, ranging from technology interventions to drama classes and producing really rigorous evidence of what works. Australia has a history of doing this. Uh, when we introduced a drug court to deal with a heroin boom in Australia in the late 1990s, uh, we ran a randomised trial. And the results of that randomised trial showed that people who went through the drug court, which allowed uh, drug rehab programs, uh, were much less likely to reoffend than those who went through the traditional criminal justice processes. We've had uh, useful randomised trials run in the tax office, looking to refine the way in which they uh, operate their auditing processes uh, and the way in which they send out letters in order to maximise the chances that taxpayers will uh, pay what, they're, uh, what they need to pay. Uh, but uh, there's other areas where we haven't done as well in terms of uh, uh, building the evidence base. 
So I see government very much as a producer and a consumer of evidence. Uh, as John so aptly said in his opening remarks, we need to be better at using evidence syntheses. We need to make sure we don't have duplication across countries where we can learn from Canada and vice versa. We should be doing that. Uh, and uh, we also need uh, better understanding of what it is to, uh, to, to use good evidence. Uh, the idea that the good old boys sitting around a table uh, may not necessarily have the same wisdom as a high quality evidence synthesis that brings together the best natural experiments and randomized trials. John, I see you nodding. Do you want to come in on this? Well, it's just, a, I mean, it may be specific to Canada and we won't have time to talk about it at length, but I'll just say we've been very struck by in our conversations with Canadian government officials, if we say regulation, they get very nervous. They kind of feel like, oh, our regulatory processes are very well established. Who are you to question them and so on? Uh, so we've tended to focus more on the strategic policy shops in government than the regulatory pieces. And the other one, when Michelle asked about taxes and so on, I was just struck by how, and Andrew would of course know how to have these conversations, but we cannot break through uh, to people in places like Ministry of Finance who are so focused on the most recent econometric analysis that gives them an elasticity, and they're really not interested in what about the 30 other studies that have been conducted. It, whatever the most recent econometric study with the right bells and whistles captures their attention and they're not interested in uh, the stuff that went before. So we're finding that we're having to figure out how do you find language that will resonate with people because we're often talking about such big cultural divides in how different parts of government think about evidence and think about using it in decision making. Great. Thanks so much, John. Julian and Zach, I want to shift gears and start talking about enhancing and leveraging the global evidence architecture. And, and you've been a part of these conversations. Um, so I'm hoping you can shed more light on progress and what success looks like. And Julian, I'll, I'll start with you. So, you know, what, what progress are you seeing that is making creating global public goods and this global evidence architecture more attainable? Are we getting closer? Mm -hmm. No, thanks, Jen. And um, thanks for the opportunity to join. This is a great session. Um, so I would just start with the first point of John's conclusion. Uh, he said, we need to capitalize on windows of opportunity and not just return to old ways of doing things. And I think that's that's a very prevalent um, kind of theme, I think, in the, in the kind of global evidence community at the moment. I think there's a very strong sense that, um, as John mentioned, you know, there are a number of things that we learned, a number of innovations that came out of the pandemic, including living evidence and, and, that, and the kind of rise of that approach. But of course, it also demonstrated a, a number of the kind of fundamental weaknesses of our current global evidence um, architecture. And I think one of the key um, uh, failings uh, that that we as an evidence community have really recognized is that, you know, although there were some really kind of standout examples, great examples, as a whole, as a community, we really failed to collaborate effectively across the globe. So we saw enormous duplication, waste, and of course, you know, during a crisis, that was really, um, you know, such a such a significant failure that had, you know, very very meaningful consequences um, to the way decisions were made, and then ultimately, of course, to our societies. Um, and of course, this goes well beyond health. You know, many of the questions that we've been dealing with through the pandemic are really not health specific questions; they're crossing all of society. So, I really see that as a very significant window of opportunity. Um, you know, it is that sense of a burning platform. Um, I think that, you know, med many, many people and organizations have been trying to develop better international collaboration for decades. Um, and the pandemic has really highlighted how little progress we have made. Um, and so, you know, through the work of the Commission, um, through the, um, the WHO Evidence to Policy Summit, Cochrane Convenes, and many other conversations, I think what we're seeing is really a very unique moment in which there's a very broad and deep recognition um, of those failures. And I, I think quite a strong commitment to refresh our efforts um, to do better. Um, so that that is that is very important, I think, having having that widespread motivation. Um, then of course the question is, so what what do we do with those conditions? 
Um, and so, you know, you mentioned the uh, Living Evidence Alliance, you know, we and others, you know, just beginning to explore how might we work better, get better together uh, across the globe? How can we try to reduce the amount of du duplication and waste? Um, and can we can we essentially use the living evidence model um, to create these kind of new opportunities? So um, there's very strong interest in, in healthcare. Um, I know also there's interest in, in education and certainly in climate. I think there's a broad recognition that if we're really going to be providing to decision makers across society, including citizens, um, the best possible evidence, um, we can't do that alone. We can't do that in the kind of fragmented model, the fragmented architecture that has been prevalent up till now. You know, the whole premise of evidence systems is to create signal from the noise of science. Science is incredibly productive, um, but it's, it's, in, its productivity um, comes from um, the very human nature of, of um, you know, multiple curiosity driven kind of um, endeavors and that that creates noise. So, you know, the, at, at the end of the day, our, our, the value we're trying to bring to society is to create signal. Um, and when we're duplicating and um, wasting our efforts in this way, we're not really creating a very strong signal. We need to do much better on that. Well, thanks so much. I mean, it really sounds like you, when you share these points of light as John did, the, the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed as that saying goes. Um, Zach, I want to bring you in, and, and you bring a really interesting perspective. You chair the Guidelines International Network. You are the director of the JBI Adelaide uh, Grade Center. And so when, when you think about you know, where we are now, where we could be, what progress do you think we're making toward um, sort of a global evidence architecture? Yeah, thanks, Jen, and thanks for the invitation to take part in this webinar. I'm coming to you from Adelaide, which is the traditional lands of the Ghana people, and I'd just like to pay my respect to elders past, present, and emerging. And just like um, Julian has said, I think we, we are ready to capitalize on some of the infrastructure we have at the moment, which is um, perhaps this, some, somewhat disjointed and disconnected. But we are also quite lucky to have some groups such as Cochrane, JBI, the Guidelines International Network, Campbell, Grade and others who are really committed to working on robust evidence syntheses and guideline development. And I think increasingly committed to trying to collaborate and share work as well. Um, it's not necessarily always been easy to know what others have been doing. We do have Prospero, which is a registry for systematic reviews, which I think is great and can help reduce some deduplication and evidence syntheses. But in guidelines particularly, we have seen a lot of, uh, a lot of duplication, a lot of um, perhaps wasted resource and effort, as, as Julian and John have mentioned as well. You know, in the, in the past, as, as in my role in the Guidelines International Network, I've been a bit of a matchmaker for different guideline groups and try to set different groups up to try to get them to collaborate. Um, just like any matchmaker service, this has um, not seen the greatest results uh, when it relies on say one person or one group of people. So some things we've been doing in GIN, for example, is trying to actually uh, create a registry of guidelines where people can actually put their guidelines in uh, so others can see what other people are doing. But not only that, they can actually um, put a little flag on it to say if they're willing to share data and collaborate on guidelines as well so that we have groups from different countries actually collaborating on a lot of the guideline work as well and of course you need to then make the contextualized recommendations for your jurisdiction but there is a lot of work that can be shared so you know this is one of the positive things I think we are seeing here as well. Uh, throughout the JBI network as well, we have entities in over, uh, over 70 entities across the globe who are really producing evidence syntheses. And we try to incentivize and to reward when they actually work together, when they mentor, perhaps mentor each other, or work together on systematic reviews as well. So we're trying to obviously reduce duplication uh, across evidence synthesis, um, the evidence synthesis community as well. And finally, I think one thing that is improving as well is the formats that we're creating evidence and guidelines in, and particularly starting to uh, try to adhere, I think, to the fair data principles where we're trying to make sure our evidence syntheses and our guidelines are findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And I think technology has come a long way to help us do this and once again, reduce duplication. Thank you so much. I'm gonna to come to Maureen, uh, because I want us to get 
important word in about putting evidence at the center of everyday life. And then we're going to start taking on your questions in the chat. You have really thoughtful, thought-provoking questions. Maureen, on uh, the citizen front, and Maureen also, you wear many hats. We're very lucky many of those are with us, and you're the co-chair of our citizen leadership group. You chair the Cochrane Consumers Network, among many other roles. What are you seeing in terms of progress um, that is helping everyday citizens rely on evidence when they're making day-to-day -day decisions? So first of all, I'll say that progress is slow, <laughs> but it's happening. Um, I'm very encouraged. I think the biggest thing that I've noticed, and not just in Canada, but in many countries, is that the recognition that fostering that culture of evidence that we've been talking about for years, you know, the democratic democratization of research is it's it's a common theme that comes come that's come up for many years. But now um, people are actually redefining, you know, what you need to foster it and and the realities of our digital social media driven world are really resonating with people and they realize that we need new strategies and new solutions to actually foster that culture of evidence. And the example I'm going to give is I've had the privilege of listening to two citizen panels from my home province of Ontario in Canada um, that brought together, you know, everyday people, people maybe who, who would be my neighbors to talk about the use of evidence in everyday life. And we had a couple of different solutions and strategies that we kind of threw out there in the in the in the brief so that we could we could guide that discussion, listen to what they had. And one of the ones that we had that I thought was great was make make um make evidence the default option. So make it more available, you know, have it have it easier for people to access. And it was very interesting the discussion around that because there were like four solutions and that one kind of went kind of kind of was okay. Nobody said, oh, it's not a good idea, but the other solutions rose to the top. And that's because there is this, unfortunately, um, waning public trust in, in, in research. And people said, you know, we're more interested in learning how to develop our skills to figure out what's true, what's false, what's misleading. And we're more interested in collaborating with you to be at the table, to prioritize research and maybe even to co-produce some research. And, and so, yes, that's that's always there and it's always, and, and things like educational programs to help people, that, that those are the things that the citizens were more interested in and saying, if you just keep giving, doing the same thing that you've been doing, um, that's not really working. And as they, some of them said, you know, the other side is doing a really good job in getting our attention. So I thought that was really interesting. And I see that as, I see that realization that we need to change strategies as real progress. And I think we will, we will advance in understanding that the culture of evidence is all three recommendations sit under the umbrella of, of the culture of evidence. And we're one part of that. Thanks, Jen. Thanks so much, Maureen. I think, Jeremy, you're going to walk us through the, the questions in the chat. I am. Thanks. It's very, it's <laughs> Thank you. Questions in the chat. Um, uh, the first one is sort of particularly sort of quite um, um, specific. So I'm going to maybe ask Julian if you want to respond to um, Pavel's uh, question about what do you think about directly collaborating with corporations to improve information delivery systems? Uh, you mentioned chat GPT, but there's also Google search, for example. Um, you know, do you think there's opportunities for us uh, uh, to do that more collaboratively with, with um, existing, uh, particularly commercial sources? Yeah, no, thanks, Jeremy. Um, <laughs> so look, I think there are, there's definitely opportunities for conversations. Um, I mean, there are things like Google search will often um, uh, present information from Wikipedia. And so, of course, then many organizations, including Cochrane, have been working with Wikipedia for many, many years, I think very effectively, um, given it is actually the most um, commonly used source um, for scientific information in the world. Um, the rise of um, tools like ChatGPT, and of course, we'll see many more. And later this year, we expect, you know, GPT-4 to the underlying language model to also to be launched. So we'll continue to see, I think, a um, improvement in, in uh, the, the language models and their application, which is 
quite a significant shift in the way the information will be um, accessible for people. Of course, as has been highlighted currently, um, GPT can be very plausible, but are wholly wrong at times. Um, and so, you know, the persistent issue we've always had of um, the trustworthiness of information and how citizens navigate those kind of spaces um, continues. It's just, it's another iteration. Now, of course, the, the models will improve, the tools will improve. So I think we will we'll see improving accuracy in, in, in that information that's being presented. But, but I think, um, thankfully, I think there's a very um, strong and active awareness and discussion and um, amongst the technology community about the, the importance of accuracy. Um, I think this has really risen through the, you know, this, this new era of misinformation. Um, so there's definitely a, like an enabling environment for very productive conversations within, within that community and specifically with some of the major firms that are um, implementing these products. Great. And I think the next question, um, uh, I'm also going to sort of, uh, uh, Pavel, you get two questions, but partly because there's a nice subsidiary question from Melanie. Um, so one question was, what's being done to share evidence since this experience outside, uh, with specialists outside of health and policy making, and who also deal with evidence, such as a journalist, financial market analyst, etc. And also, um, Melanie added to that in terms of you know, what's happening in terms of developing one-stop shops to conclude tools to develop evidence synthesis and collaborate and reduce duplication uh, 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 as a would-be valuable resource. Um, so I don't know who wants to maybe talk to um, Zachary's first about uh, going beyond health and going beyond evidence synthesis. Lara. Yeah, just quickly sharing uh, two experiences here because the one-stop shops, they are so useful, but when we think about language barriers, specifically for the Latin America and the Caribbean uh, region, sometimes we are not able to um, produce everything we need to produce in our own language and uh, put this in a one-stop shop, maybe in English. But we have been working a lot with developing uh, translations and the, the Global Commission report is a great example of that, of having these resources available in our own languages. So the um, Brazilian Coalition for Evidence has a repository of tools and is now working on having a repository of shared questions in both uh, Portuguese and Spanish for the Latin America and the Caribbean hub. And one thing I think is worth noticing is that specifically to, to Pavel's question around um, how we engage people who are not from the health or maybe policymaking fields. We, we did an assessment in Brazil in 2021 when we were creating the Brazilian Coalition for Evidence about how much the available training for evidence synthesis was super focused on health uh, or health policymaking. Um, and then we started understanding the importance of the equity debate in Brazil and last year we were able to develop uh, based on all the great materials we have for the health field uh, an adaptation in Portuguese of a course that we focus on inviting people from different social sciences and also journalists uh, that are very early career um, undergraduates and that had questions that were not so easily answered by the like we don't have so many systematic reviews around racism or right to to the city and some questions that are really um, part of the Brazilian reality so we just developed this course it was a course with mentorship we engaged these people we understood the limitations also of having the tools we usually use translated to question there are either more complex or we don't have so many um, systematic reviews available. And I think this is, was a great lesson for us to understand how to better communicate uh, with these different, uh, different, these groups that are now very much part of the conversation of the complex problems and its solutions, but don't approach usually through the same path that we had or the same tools that we develop in the health field. So just adding to this debate, I don't have a solution, <laughs> just a bunch of lessons we learn in this experience with early career researchers from these different fields. That's wonderful, Lauren. I do think that issue of linguistic accessibility is something we have to think globally, um, you know, really to try and do, do better on that job. Um, I'm, I'm going to come to the question from uh, Sandy Zellman. 
who was talking about regarding the goals of increasing coordination, building connections, and enhancing the global evidence architecture has been new effort to use, I think, fair standards for living evidence guide, uh, guidance and quality assessments. And I don't know whether either Zach or Julian, you want to have first crack of that? Uh, I'm, I'm aware we're almost at time. So very quickly, so FIRE is a very specific um, health data interoperability standard. And yes, there are specific um, projects. And um, uh, I can follow up afterwards, um, Sandra, if you want to hear more about that. Great. So actively going on. Uh, the final question, I'm, I'm, asking, I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to get to yours, but um, Michelle Aby uh, was also was talking about what is really being done to include low middle income countries in global networks and to build capacity in LMICs. Most networks are led by high income countries and a lot of the inclusion of LMICs is tokenism without real capacity building. I think Lara has already talked about sort of uh, the experience in a middle income country and this doing exceptional good work. But um, John, would you like to say anything about sort of the inclusion of LMICs in the various networks? I know during COVID and, and the Global Commission, we worked quite hard to try and ensure that, and there are some really amazing experiences like the African Evidence Network. Absolutely. But, you know, Michelle is right. At the end of the day, we have to do much better than we've done in the past. And we're now seeing more centers of gravity that are in middle income countries with a lot of the leadership happening there. Um, you know, our idea about how the future can look better than the past in terms of this funding model is that these global public good producing teams would really be equitably distributed around the globe. Many of them have to be in low income countries um, and then they need to be partnering with their domestic evidence support units in those countries. We have lots of collaborators in those environments, but you know, as Michelle's pointing out, it's just so hard. They're dealing with so many other things. Um, it's hard for them to uh, push their way into leadership positions. So I think it's just incumbent on all of us to figure out how through funding, many other mechanisms we do better so that there really is distributed leadership because no question, it's unfortunately often driven by high and increasingly now middle income countries with not enough low income country leadership. That's, that's great, John. Um, I think we probably have to wrap up. We're a couple of minutes uh, left. So, Jen, I'm going to hand back to you for final comments. But thank you, everyone, for um, uh, the great questions in the chat. And uh, um, I think it's really stimulated some good conversation. Jen. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Jeremy. So your feedback for those who are listening, we um, would like to have it. And you can send it our way, evidencecommission at mcmaster.ca. You can circulate it there. We do have our update report coming at the end of the month. So the presentation that John shared today will inform that report, but you know, the work continues. We're, we're working on this. So we, we want to engage with you. And if you're interested in doing so as well, we again encourage you to reach out. So look for the update report that's coming at the end of the month. The recording and slides from today's presentation are also gonna be coming your way. I'm pleased to share that uh, some of our speakers from today's webinar this morning and now um, this morning if you're in Australia, uh, have prepared short videos and we'll be circulating those through our social channels over the next few weeks and they give a bit more insight on each of the implementation priorities. Um, and then finally, again, if you're compelled to get involved in this work, we want you to work with us. So reach out to us, evidencecommission at mcmaster.ca. And most importantly, I just want to say thank you to our speakers for giving their time and expertise today and all the days it took to get to today. So thank you for being here and uh, that adjourns today's webinar. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.